<laughs> Amen. <laughs> we are in church, folks. <laughs> so, a patient was in the operating room, all ready for his surgery. His doctor entered, walked up to the table, and said, now, Dave, there's absolutely nothing to worry about. This, this is a simple, routine procedure. There's nothing to worry about. Do you hear that, Dave? There's nothing to worry about. And the patient looks at him and he goes, well, thank you, doctor, but my name isn't Dave. <laughs> to which the doctor looks startled, but replies, I know that. I was talking to myself. <laughs> let it go. Let it go. <laughs> so my talk title today is Why Worry? I think we'd all agree that if we were the patient, maybe for a moment, before we let it go, we might have a bit of concern. But, you know, I really wanted to look at how worrying in general, especially chronic worrying, can create a lot of truly unnecessary suffering. Yet the fact is, we tend to be prone to it. And so I thought maybe we could examine some ways we could support ourselves in transcending those worrying patterns. I I think I should start by saying that, is there any greater way to waste our time and deplete ourselves of energy than to just keep worrying? It sucks the life right out of us. No, am I wrong? <laughs> I think as author, <laughs> thank you, as author and motivational speaker, Leo Bashalia put it, Worry saps today of its joy. I have to say, I'm standing before you as one who was a big, big time worrier for a lot of my life. I can recall all the way back into my childhood, you know, having a lot of anxiety, waking up in the morning just all worried about, you know, what am I going to have for breakfast? Um, <laughs> And really, that followed me all the way up into my adult years. And over the years, I became aware of the you know, negative side effects of worrying, such as you know, those digestive disorders that we feel, the emotional discomfort that we feel, the sleep deprivation that we experience. And then somewhere in my 30s, I remember coming across an article that was put together by a medical doctor that talked about other, other uh, physical side effects of worry. Um, I found out that it is a real immune depressant, that worry depresses our immune system, leaving us prone to illnesses, ranging from colds and flus and the like, to what we might label as much more serious illnesses, like diabetes, obesity, cancer, heart disease, asthma, and I understand lately they've added dementia and Alzheimer's to the list. <laughs> Yay! One more thing. <laughs> and I have to say, you know, back then, I was aware of what a gift I was given in stumbling across this article. Because I was given one more thing that I could worry about. <laughs> I could now worry about how much time I spent worrying. <laughs> how creative is that? And you know, I think most of us would probably agree that worry isn't healthy, and it's certainly not enjoyable. And despite that, it seems to be kind of challenging to shake it. Has anyone noticed? You know, if simply knowing about the negative impact of worrying was enough to stop us. I think we all would have stopped worrying a long time ago. So what is it 
that compels us to still engage in this pattern of worrying. And there are a few things, but the first thing I'd like us to point out so we can have a bit of compassion for ourselves about this is our brain, our human brain, holds on to negative memories more than positive ones. And this goes back to prehistoric times. You know, when our ancestors lived in a world where they were so vulnerable to different things like a saber-toothed tiger that could attack at any time. They really had to be mindful of all the existing and potential dangers that they might encounter in order to survive. So it's a survival instinct. And we have incarnated into a human body that at this time, in this phase of its evolution, still has this part of the mind that when we think of possible negative outcomes, or when we're looking and fixating on negative things that are going around, which we're kind of conditioned to look at, because again, survival instinct, our body responds the same as if we were about to be attacked by a saber-toothed tiger. So the adrenaline goes up, the blood pressure goes up, all of these things start happening, which are not in proportion to what's really happening at the time, and they're causing some negative effects. So there's that side of it. So let's just admit that we are in a physical body that was conditioned at this point in time, it still has this response, inner response going on in the brain. Another reason I think for us to consider, think of all the disastrous scenarios that you have imagined for yourself, that you have fixated on over and over again, that never materialized. Now that idea may seem to contradict science of mind, where we say that our thoughts create are creative and that our thoughts create our human experiences, but it really isn't. Because our key tenet is that God and God's nature is present in everything and everyone, and God's nature is for goodness. It is one of pure goodness. So the impulse of the universe, the impulse of all life is for good. There's so much more conspiring toward good than there is, you know, human thinking that thwarts it. We really have to work pretty hard to make bad things happen. So I think we, we need to realize that because we are thinking of something negative, it doesn't necessarily mean it's gonna create that exact experience. Thank God, not all the things we've imagined for ourselves have ever materialized. However, while we were thinking those negative thoughts, what were we experiencing? We were experiencing negativity. It was almost as if we were in those situations. And that, in turn, creates responses that over time can create the negative physical ailments that I mentioned earlier. So we see that, yes, our thought is creative. And yes, when we get involved in this pattern of worry and negative thinking, we are experiencing negativity. But here's the thing. Since the worst case scenario that we imagined that we worried about didn't happen, I think there's a part of us that decides, oh, I worried about it, so it didn't happen. <laughs> I stopped it from happening because I was vigilant. I worried. I worried. I thought a lot about this. And I, by worrying about it, took whatever measures to prevent it from happening. Does that sound at all familiar? And you know, it's true that I think the fear of something negative happens, happening sometimes motivates us to take a step to prevent that from happening. But, you know, let's be clear, it wasn't the fear, it wasn't the worry that prevented the negative outcome, it was the action we took. We didn't have to be worrying to take that action. We could have taken that action without the worry. But I think we associate the two together. There's this positive association of, okay, when I worry, I avoid uh, problems. And I think that's important. And also, let's be honest, sometimes isn't worrying 
about something also paralyze us and prevent us from taking action. So let's go back to this idea of worry and what I said before about the impulse of the universe is for good. Back of every worry we have, there is an impulse for some good experience. Okay, but then we're thinking of all the things that might prevent us from experiencing goodness. But the key impulse is towards something good. Within that pattern of worrying, we will still find elements of God, because we say God is in everything. You know, within the pattern of worry, there's this stewardship of looking ahead to see you know, what could potentially happen and how we could avoid problems. There's mindfulness. There's caring, that we care about what's happening, and we'd like things to work out. So these are all good qualities of God. There's absolutely nothing, nothing wrong with planning ahead, with considering where things might go wrong and setting things up to you know, potentially avoid problems. I'm, I'm a huge fan of contingency plans. Ask anyone on any project that's worked with me. They say, okay, if this doesn't work, we could do this. I, I brought my umbrella today. I know they said it's not going to rain, but the clouds look pretty dark. I thought, why not? Bring the umbrella. I'd rather be ready. Okay? <laughs> the thing is, we don't have to add the element of fear, worry, and hysteria to the equation. I like to think of it as like when we're driving. Okay, a responsible driver will maintain their vehicle so that things like the brakes going out don't happen. That's taking action to prevent something. As we're driving, hopefully, we're looking ahead, we're looking side to side, we're looking behind us. We're being mindful because we know we're moving at great speeds. There are potential things that could happen and we're trying to you know, keep our distance from the cars in front of us, please. Um, <laughs> we're taking measures in bad weather conditions, but uh, you know, hopefully we're not doing it in a state of panic the whole time of, oh my God, any second now a deer could jump out from the side, or what if, what if a meteor drops down from the sky right in front of my car? I mean, you know, all these things, we're not driving in that state of panic and hysteria. And personally, I find five car lengths is perfect for a potential meteor that just might fall. Just, just something to consider. I remember back in elementary school, I don't know why when we did this, uh, we were taken on a field trip up into uh, the mountains, uh, why we didn't charter a bus that time, but uh, some moms had volunteered to drive us. And I'm really grateful I got in the car with the fun mom. Now, the fun mom, you know, who allowed us to sing and, you know, play all kinds of games in the car, before we got in, she made sure, our kids, is everyone buckled up? Now, this was back in the days before seat belts being required. Some cars didn't even have them. But she did, and she made sure we buckled up. You know, she, at one point, I remember, as we were singing and being a little bit rowdy, she was driving through an area that was this really windy road. And she asked us, hey, kids, for a moment, can you just get quiet? I just really want to concentrate. So we were quiet for a while, and then we continued on. But she was cheerful. When we were heading back, I noticed as we're about to get in the car with Fun Mom, there was another mom <laughs> that, <clears throat> I'll just say, she was really wound up, and she was harshly, I mean really harshly warning the kids about, you better be quiet while I'm driving. You better let me concentrate. I want to make sure we all get back to the school safe and sound. And we all got back to the school safe and sound, but some of us were happy, and some of us kind of needed therapy after getting out of that second <laughs> home school. Yeah. Last week, Dr. Mark talked about the hysteria right now with the coronavirus. Right? And he was talking about, wouldn't it be nice if we could spend more of that energy that we're spending worrying and panicking on knowing that the solution, the cure, is already known in the mind of God and is revealing itself, and knowing that there are ways to protect 
you know, that we're divinely guarded and protected. If we could put more of that energy out there, I think it opens us up to that solution being revealed. But that doesn't mean that we don't necessarily, <laughs> yes. Um, it doesn't mean that we don't necessarily take measures. Like, I'm very grateful to people who are looking at ways to contain it so that others aren't infected. I'm very grateful to whomever's doing the research for the cure, to be that channel of spirit for the cure. It's not, it's not about being lackadaisical, okay? But it's about being able to take the actions with a sense of we're aligning with the impulse for good to do that which is for the greater good of all. So, you know, I was looking at, so this is a real, you know, difficult pattern for us to get, you know, get rid of sometimes, to transcend. But I was thinking, you know, we're in a season right now where many, many people around the world who celebrate the holiday of Lent, Lent are giving up something, some pleasure, which is every spiritual tradition has some version of that practice, to give something up that you enjoy, not because it's bad to enjoy it, but simply to remind ourselves that we are not dependent on things in the world for our pleasure, for our well-being. But I thought, what about if we dedicated these days to giving up a pattern that doesn't serve us, like worry? What if we spent 40 days really being observant of ways we engage in worry and took measures to rise above that? As Eckhart Tolle tells us, a worried mind isn't capable of solving problems. Real solutions always come from a state of positive clarity. They come from the greater impulse of good underneath the worried pattern. So what I'm going to invite us to consider is when we catch ourselves in those patterns of worrying about something, notice it, pause, right then, take a breath. Right now with me, just take a nice deep breath. Notice how right there, something shifted, something for the better. And I think we need to call forth compassion for ourselves, just knowing that okay, this is a human pattern that's been around for a long time. It's been since prehistoric man, but I don't have to engage in it. But just be compassionate that it's, helping, that it's happening. And then this is where some of our spiritual practices, especially meditation, can be very helpful. You know, in, in your meditation, if you just spend a few minutes a day, which science has proven has such positive effects, as a worry thought arises, don't, don't push it away. Let it come up and just watch it for a moment. Just notice it and go, oh, yeah, that's, that's that worry thinking. That's a thing that you know, so many of us are conditioned to engage in. It's just a pattern. It's not who I really am, as Jamie reminded us. And then, after we've let it dissolve a little bit, then bring our attention back to the breath or whatever the thing was that we were focusing on, a mantra. You know, maybe some people like to meditate watching a candle. We, we don't want to suppress the worrying thoughts. We want to let them come up and look at them objectively and reframe them. Something that can be helpful, too, is to write down your worry thoughts. The minute you start writing down your thoughts, you're engaging a different part of the brain than the part of the brain that you know, is in for a fight or flight. So you engage that, and also you put the worry thought out there objectively. And you can look at it and start asking yourself, what's the underlying intention of God for some greater good? If there's a fear of failure, there's a deeper intention to do something that is of value that others appreciate. That's the impulse of God's love to give of itself unto itself. It's beautiful. That's a beautiful intention. Uh, if you're worrying about an illness, that's the impulse for perfect health and well-being to be expressed. If you're in a pattern of worrying about lack, you know, that's the abundance of God in you seeking to be more fully known and realized. So as you realize what the deeper impulse is, then honor that intention for good and support yourself. That's when we do our affirmations. That's when we do our prayers. That's when we do our mantras, you know, knowing that life is for me and never against, against me. 
God's abundance fills me, fills all creation. We keep redirecting the mind to that truth. I invite you to spend time just contemplating things that are inspiring. Step out, look at the sky, look at the clouds, and just see how much good there is in the universe to remind ourselves that there's more of an impulse for good than there is for anything negative. And then begin to explore the steps that you can take, you know, some action you can take toward the greater good. It might just be to pick up the phone and make a call. Maybe you need to do a little bit of research. Fill out an application. Whatever it is, take that one step and then step back for a moment, just like we hear in the creation story when God created the earth. Step back and say, it is good. Feel the goodness of the action that you took because that builds up the momentum to then be inspired to take the next step and then the one after that. And if it's something that you really have no control over, you can still offer a prayer, you can donate to a cause, you can be a volunteer. Just think of the one positive thing you can do and keep building from that. You build the enthusiasm and momentum to take subsequent steps. And also, science is telling us too today, things like physical activity, exercise, yoga, tai chi, those are things that, you know, again, engage the part of the brain that are toward health and wholeness and fullness that you know, get our minds off the worrying pattern. Playful activities, coloring, painting, drawing, just, you don't have to be a good artist, but doodle. You'll be amazed how your mind gets engaged and is pulled off that worrying, fear-based pattern. See, as we support ourselves in these ways, we support ourselves in facing and addressing current or potential problems without getting entangled in the patterns of worry and fear. We create a, what I would say is a more optimistic mindset which opens us to the solutions and existing, you know, to the existing and potential problems and it inspires us to then move forward and implement those solutions. And I just want to say that as much as science of mind and spiritual practices have helped me to overcome chronic worrying, I'm a much, much less of a worrier today than I was. I'm dedicating myself, especially in the season of Lent, to continuing to release any propensities I have toward worry and to embrace this more affirmative, optimistic approach to life. I hope you'll all join me. Yeah. Nice. Thank you. Thank you. Let's pray. So as we turn our attention inward, just feeling that part of us at every moment seeks to be happy, to be well, to be free of any suffering, and to recognize that as the impulse of that one life, that one infinite goodness that I call God, that one that lives and moves its, and has its being throughout all creation. Let us absolutely join together in knowing right here, right now, that that life that fills our being, that fills everything in creativity is greater than any negative situation that we create out of our sense of separateness from it. I absolutely know that where there is any pattern right now of us to obsess on the negative, to worry, that we join right now in the intention to just let that go and instead to be open and receptive vessels to looking ahead, looking at what's before us. And if we see a problem or a potential problem to be a channel of the divine, to bring forth the solution, to affect the solution, to embrace the solution. We let this prayer be a prayer for our loved ones, family, situations in the world that call to our attention. I know that we are absolutely blessed in coming together, that there's much healing that occurs in our time together. And we bless our church, we bless all churches everywhere, synagogues, temples, mosques, ashrams, all paths to God. And with a full and grateful heart for the good that God is always, I release this word, knowing it is so, I let it be, and so it is. And together we say, Amen.